but yeah, so today's talk, um, we're going to, I'm going to talk about, mostly about the common Nighthawk. We're going to sort of start with, um, it kind of all started with the Wild Research Nature Survey, actually. So it kind of, it kind of all comes from that, that core. And, and we'll, as we go through the talk, we'll, we'll hit that program at some point. Um, basically, the intention of today is to kind of tell the arc of, of where we were at when we, when we, um, when the last Kosuic assessment of the species was, and then kind of what we've learned since then, and, and kind of where I think maybe we should be going for this species. Um, so yeah, so I guess we'll get started. And if anyone, if I'm going too fast at any point, some of this might be a little bit technical. Um, someone please just shout out and, and feel free to jump in with questions. Um, yeah, so first we're gonna we're gonna ask the question, what's in nature? I think <laughs> I'm I'm kind of a, a nature advocate at heart. And so um I know it's burning night, probably everyone knows what a nature is, but I, I really like the just the the sort of the basics of the Capra Mulgids um education. So we're gonna do that first, then we'll meet the common night hawk. We'll talk about conservation status. Um we'll look at some of the knowledge gaps that were identified in that Coast Uric report. Um and then we'll go work through what we've learned about some of those knowledge gaps. So we're gonna talk about migratory connectivity um, and then we're gonna to move to the breeding grounds, talk about monitoring and that's where we'll talk about the nitro survey. Uh, we'll talk about some habitat relationships, population estimates, and then we'll, we'll do a little bit of synthesis at the end. So me, I know Angela introduced me already, but it's just a little bit more about my sort of species specific background. Um, I am a pastoral ecologist by training. So I was the program manager for the Wild Research Nature Survey from 2010 to 2020. I did my PhD on common nighthawks, um, which I just defended last September. Um, I'm also a founding member of what is now called the Global Night Giant Network. So this is sort of the next, the next level of um, sort of bringing night jar researchers together. Um, there's not a lot of us, so we're kind of starting to, to try and reach out across the world and, and share knowledge and, and commonalities about, about these various species um, between countries and continents. So I know, you know, I know some things about night jars, but I know a lot about common night hawks. So if you have common night hawk questions, you have come to the right place. So what about you? I guess I can't see you guys because I'm doing the screen share thing, but you know, have you seen any nitrous? Are there folks that have done a citizen science survey in the audience? I know I recognize some names. I definitely know there are some out there. Um, you know, Angela mentioned, Angela talked about her route a little bit. Um, yeah, sorry, this, <laughs> this part of the talk is usually given live. Um, the, the, Zoom, the Zoom format doesn't always translate. Maybe we'll jump into what's a night jar. So night jars are very, I, I've read that it's, it's been described as a, as a very old body design. So they're actually way down at the base of the phylogenetic tree. Um, you know, the phylogenetic tree starts here and they're actually, you know, they're not, they're way down here. So the, the, the general night jar body form evolved a long time ago. And you can see they sort of split off right here, sort of at the, at the base of that phylogenetic tree. So here's Caprimulgus and here's our, this looks like maybe a European night jar here. And, but since so since that divergence, the the Capramulgid family has has expanded across the globe. So this is this is a distribution of all nightjar species across across the world. And in North America, um, we're dealing with two of these clades. So we've got uh, the nighthawk clade and the porwell clade, and we'll get into a little bit of those in a couple minutes. But those are those are the two that we've got here in North America. And so what makes a nightjar across all of these species? Um, sort of what are the what are the things that they have in common? And again, this part of the talk was kind of like more of a question and response um, setup, but I'll just go through them just because it, it doesn't quite work. Um, so first of all, all nature species are nocturnal or in the case of the night hawks, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, are crepuscular. Because they're nocturnal, they rely really heavily on acoustic communication. So uh, a lot of species have very defining vocal calls. Um, in North America, a lot of them are named for those vocal calls, like whippoorwill, poorwill, chuckwill's widow. Um, they all have very cryptic plumage to sort of keep them hidden during the day, uh, avoid predation. They're all aerial insectivores. Um, so the nighthawk is not a hawk, it eats bugs. And I think this is kind of a neat video. So this is actually a sample of um, a food bolus that a, a male nighthawk was carrying to give to his, to his um, 
to his nestlings. And I think this is kind of neat. You can see this is what it's like to catch live insects in midair and then hold them in your mouth. These are the, these are longhorn beetles and they're still wiggling around in this, in this food bowl. So that's what some of these guys are eating. Uh, all nitros have these real large eyes with a reflective layer called the tapeta lucida that's at the back of the retina um, to improve their night vision. They have these prominent rictal bristles, so you can see them on this guy right here. Um, the nighthawks less so, and then they have this tiny bill and this huge mouth, and that's to facilitate capturing their aerial insect prey. They have short legs with weak feet. And then one of the things that I think is really neat is they all have this... Um, they have this uh, comb on the middle toe. Um, not really sure what it's for. It's probably for grooming, um, but that's something that all of the night jars have. That's kind of neat. A lot of them have white patches for mating display. So here's a couple of photos of male night hawks. We've got the white patches on the wings and on the tail. You can also see it on the, on the throat there. Most species lay two eggs on bare ground. So um, this is, this is not a group of birds that make actual nests. They just, you know, they call it a scrape, which to be honest, in some cases is a bit of a generous description. I mean, this bird is sort of like, it's maybe pushed a couple of pine needles out of the way, but other than that, it's really just eggs on the ground. Uh, and so part of that nesting strategy though, is they have these semi-precocial young. So they're not fully precocial. They're not like shorebirds where they hatch and run to the ocean. Um, but they can walk, you know, within a few hours of hatching, um, and they certainly start to move around real quick. Um, and that, that's, you know, it's a, um, that's a strategy for, to prevent predation because they're, they're nesting right on the ground. And so in Canada, we have these two subfamilies or these two clades. We have the porwell clade and the nighthawk clade, and they are actually quite different. So for the porwell clade, Canada, in Canada, we have three of 16 species globally. So those three species would be porwell, whippoorwill, and then we do uh, occasionally get, I think there's, I think there's a breeding pair of um, chuckles, widows, and P and Point Pelee in Ontario. Um, and then in the nighthawks, we have the one species, um, the common nighthawk. So the, the poor whales are, are really more nocturnal, whereas the, the nighthawks are more crepuscular. Um, and that, that has a lot to do with their feeding strategy. So the poor whale clade um, are sally feeders. They're kind of like a, a fly catcher. They perch and then they fly up and catch things, whereas the nighthawks are, are continuous flight feeders, more like a, a nighttime swallow. And because of that, so the poor whales have these much more prominent rictal bristles, and then they have some smaller ones, longer bills, shorter bills. I've read that the porwells have softer plumage. I don't know how true that is because I've only ever caught nighthawks. Um, and then, you know, that they also, their wing shape is also adapted to those, those flight strategies. So the nighthawks have these real long pointed wings for continuous flight, whereas the porwell clade has these shorter round wings. And you can see that a little bit in some of these photos. So you can see the real long wings on the nighthawk here. And then this is the common porwell here. And he's just a real stubby little guy. And so we're going to talk about the nighthawks for the rest of the talk today. So back to our phylogenetic tree. Um, the nighthawks are part of the Cordalis genus. And so this is a new world genus. It's only in the Western hemisphere. Uh, six species, three-ish are migratory. We're not really sure about the other ones. So one thing I should say, you know, because of their nocturnal um, sort of lifestyle or life history, there's very little known about a lot of the night jars. You know, the nighthawk is arguably our best understood species in the entire um, entire family. And even then we're sort of, you know, we're just sort of breaking ground on basic like natural history. So um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, migratory status is unknown for a lot of these species. Um, and the Cordelis, Cordelis means evening dancer, which I think is really lovely um, because of the, it's that it's that sort of, nighttime swallow thing. It's that constant flight foraging in the evening. Um, and, and again, they're crepuscular as opposed to purely nocturnal. And so we're, yeah, we're here in the Nahut clade. Here are our six species. And then we're here in the common nighthawk. So this is kind of, you know, it's a really neat species. Um, the common nighthawk has one of the largest breeding ranges in North America. I mean, all the way from Alaska uh, down into, there's some isolated breeding populations in, in Panama. Um, they have a pretty diverse opportunistic diet. Um, like I said before, two eggs, typically one brood. Um, and 
you know, they have, I think one of the things that I really like about them is their vocal characteristics. And they admittedly spent a lot of time studying <laughs> their acoustic behavior for my PhD, but I think it's just um, these really iconic sounds. So we're actually gonna listen to them. So they have this vocal paint. Um, I've read it described as um, what it sounds like when you whisper the weird word beard. So I don't know, you can beard, beard. Some people think it sounds like that. <laughs> I think it's kind of a funny description. Uh, but then they also have this mechanical wing boom display. Uh, and we're actually going to talk about what that wing boom display means later on in the talk today. Um, but it's neat. They take this steep aerial dive. And at the bottom of that aerial dive, they bend their wingtips down. And as the wind rushes through those wingtips, it, it makes this vroom sound. It's it's just, it's, it's mechanical. It's not vocal at all. It's just produced by wind um, on their wingtips. And so this is a video that uh, one of the folks I worked with in Northern Alberta took of that wing boom display. It's pretty hard to capture. So there it is. And then the video is going to slow down. And it's going to sound a little nightmarish, but you can see it a little bit better. And so you can see at the bottom there, he's really bending those wing tips down. And that's a big part of what produces that, produces that sound. So, but this species is declining. So here's our breeding birds survey map and red is bad, red means declines. Uh, we do see variable declines across the range, but you know, the average from 1970 to 2015 in Canada is 2.5% is decline per year. This is, so the species is listed as least concern by the IUCN and that's just, I mean, partly just because the breeding range is so huge. Um, in Canada, they are listed as threatened under a Species at Risk Act. They were recommended for downlisting, I believe it was a year and a half ago by COSUIC, so downlisting to special concern, based on the fact that there's a lot more of them in the boreal forest than we originally thought there were, and we'll get into some of that later in the talk as well. Um, but also because the declines are less steep than they used to be, um, that downlisting has not taken legal effect um, as far as I know to date. I think I checked it a couple weeks ago. Um, and, but they have been imperiled in several of the Eastern US states. So, you know, they, they are becoming extirpated in some regions of the US. Um, so, you know, we're seeing big differences in, in the sort of the extent of the declines depending on where you are in the breeding range. I know certainly speaking to folks who, um, who have lived on sort of prairie landscapes for, for their lifetimes. You know, there's certainly a lot of evidence for anecdotal declines for this species. People talking about sort of missing the presence of nighthawks on late warm summer nights and, and them just not being there the way they used to be. Um, so certainly a species that we are concerned about. One of the reasons we're concerned about them is they are part of this group of birds called the aerial insectivores. And so aerial insectivores are declining faster you know, they're sort of tied with grassland birds down here at the bottom here. Um, but they are declining faster than any other group of birds in Canada right now. And there's a lot of potential reasons why. So, you know, there's this idea of phenological mismatch, which basically means that with climate change, um, as springs begin to warm earlier, we get these long distance migrants who are using other cues to decide when to arrive on the breeding grounds. And when they get here, they've already missed sort of peak food abundance because of that, because of those increasingly warmer springs. Um, wetland loss is a big one that's often identified as a potential threat. And that's because, you know, certainly in more arid landscapes, uh, aerial insectivores are often relying on wetlands for foraging opportunities. And, and there's some evidence to show that the food that they're obtaining um, from wetlands is also richer in some of these really important fatty acids. Um, pesticide application, obviously, you know, some potential sort of sublethal threats to individuals themselves, but then also effects on their food source. Uh, light pollution can really disrupt aerial insect populations. And so there's you know, there's some thought that perhaps that's affecting aerial insectivorous birds as well. And then of course, increased weather extremes. There's some new evidence for that, especially on migration. A lot of these species are long distance migrants. And so those increased weather extremes can be really challenging, uh, especially, you know, flying over a large body of water like the Gulf of Mexico. Are there potential threats? You know, so this is a paper that um, sort of a, uh, opinion piece that we published in uh, avian conservation ecology um, a couple years ago. You know, there's 
the, the list goes on and on and on with these potential threats are, you know, habitat loss, vehicle collisions, climate change, pollution, predation. Um, it's, it's hard to narrow down. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about, about maybe how to start narrowing down this list. And so one of the first steps when we look at this huge list of, of potential causes of declines is to identify knowledge gaps. Like, so what are the pieces of information that we need to start to tease this list apart and rule out some, and you know, I mean, chances are these is a migratory species, chances are it's probably more than one, and it probably depends on where and when in their annual cycle they are. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the knowledge gaps that were identified in a 2016 recovery, recovery strategy for the common IHOP were migratory connectivity, monitoring methods, habitat, diet, population estimates, and demographic parameters. And by demographic parameters, I just mean like survival rates, birth rates, death rates, that kind of stuff. So really, some of these really basic numbers to figure out sort of what's driving populations. So let's look at how far we've come in. Well, I guess it's not five years anymore, it's six years. <laughs> We're in 2022 now. Um, but let's look at how far we've come in the last five or six years, because actually we've learned a lot. So the first one we're gonna talk about is migratory connectivity. Now this is admittedly sometimes a, a little bit of a counterintuitive concept, but it's actually a really valuable tool for understanding um, the conservation of migratory species. So migratory connectivity, is the extent to which populations are connected across the annual cycle. So it's basically saying like, these birds that breed here together, do they then winter together as well? So it's typically estimated, yeah, it's typically estimated between the breeding and the wintering grounds. And so it's like, if connectivity is strong, then you have a, a, you have a migratory connectivity value of one. And that means that this population sticks together and they all winter together on these grounds. And so you can see that example here for rose-bested grosbeak. Uh, we have weak connectivity, it essentially means there's not really any pattern between the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds. And so you get a, a migratory connectivity value of zero. And so you can see that in, in uh, green winged teal here, they, they, they're all together, they're in the population of the breeding grounds, but then they're all mixing together on the wintering grounds. And the reason that this is important for understanding population declines is it basically determines how vulnerable each population is to local environmental conditions when they're not on the breeding grounds. So it's essentially like if this population stays together uh, throughout their annual cycle, then you know the the things that are affecting that population could be happening anywhere in their annual cycle. It could be on migration, it could be on the wintering grounds. But if they're mixing together on the wintering grounds with other populations, then the, what they're experiencing on that wintering grounds is going to affect the population trends of the entire, sort of more at the entire species level as opposed to at the population level. And so when we're, when we're looking at species that have these varying population trends, like we do see in the common night hawk, you know, we talked about how some populations are declining and there are some that are increasing. You know, we tend to want to then look for times in their annual cycle when they have this increased migratory connectivity to start, start to think about, okay, well, what could be causing those differences in population trend? And so that's why migratory connectivity has been called a useful first step in evaluating causes of differential population trends among locations. And so we set out to figure out what migratory connectivity is for this species. So myself and a whole bunch of really great folks uh, put out GPS tags on common night hawks at 13 locations across their breeding range. So these are kind of neat tags. Night hawks are really, 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 really hard to recapture. I mean, they're hard to capture in the first place, um, let alone recapture. And so these tags are kind of interesting. They're, they're called an Argos GPS tag. And so that means that they take GPS points. So it's, you know, it's basically like your car GPS. Um, so usually about 10 meter location accuracy, but then they take a couple of points and then they upload them. They basically scream at the sky and they upload those points to the Argo satellite with, and then we can download those, those points. The trade-off is that that screaming at the sky is really battery intensive. So the tags don't always work. And when they do, we don't get a ton of locations. So we're talking, you know, for each of these birds that we've put tags on, and these are the numbers of tags that we deployed at each of these locations. For each of these birds, you know, we're getting maybe 30 locations. You know, if we're lucky, we're getting 60. There are a couple of birds where we got like one or two points. Um, 
So, you know, the, the amount of information we get really varies. And so because this is, we're learning about Nighthawks, I just wanted to introduce you to Maurice. Maurice is a really important part of the Nighthawk team. Uh, so Maurice uh, was sort of the brainchild of Janet Ng, who did her master's thesis on common Nighthawks with Mark Brigham. And she <laughs> figured out how to catch Nighthawks, which has been really fundamental to a lot of things that we've learned about them since then. And, and the key to catching a Nighthawk is, is Maurice, because he's super handsome. So we mentioned her at the beginning of the talk, um, those white wing patches are really important for mating displays. And so if you have big white patches, wing patches, tail patches, throat patches like Maurice, it means you're very, very handsome and you're very threatening. And so the key to catching an hawk is to actually put Maurice in the net. And so we're gonna watch. This is how you catch an hawk. Ellie, Ellie, before you share, can you make sure the sound is included when you share? Oh, yes. I think I forgot to do that, didn't I? Thank you for interrupting me. Okay, I'm gonna... So, so you have to stop sharing and start again. Yeah. Did you miss the boom then? You did, didn't you? Yeah. Should I replay that? Oh, uh, thank you for reminding me. Okay, share sound. Here we go. Here we go. Does anyone, should we do, want, should we listen to the boom again? Does anyone want to hear it? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of fun when it slows down. Let's do that and then we'll and then we'll move on. Can you hear it now? Yes. Thank you. I just think it's kind of funny when it when it slows down. Um, okay. Let me just jump forward. Okay. So let's, yeah, let's, um, let's catch an Nighthawk. Maurice catches a Nighthawk. So because night, Nighthawks are, you know, they catch flying insects out of the air uh, at dusk, they have probably just like got pretty good vision. And so when you catch a Nighthawk, they can see the nets, um, you know, they, they're not dumb. And so the key is to just, get them really frustrated. Um, and so the key is to put your nets somewhere um, where an individual is territorial, but then to also, you know, you put Maurice in the net um, and then they they eventually get so frustrated with Maurice that they make a mistake and they they end up um, getting caught in the net. So here's our, here's a Nighthawk, he comes in because we've got, um, we're playing some recordings of a Nighthawk. And he's obviously, pretty upset because Maurice is so handsome. He's swooping and diving. And then eventually he makes a mistake and ends up in the net and then he just kind of hangs out and then we come back and we take him out. Um, you know, and then we make sure that he's healthy, he's a good size, he, he's big enough to carry the GPS tag. Um, you know, we check that he's got enough fat and he's got enough muscle. Um, and then we put a little backpack on him so that he can, uh, he can carry the GPS tag. So this is, this is a video um, that was put together with some of the results from, from those GPS tags, I think. Is this going to work? Mm. I and I, I won't talk through this one because there's, you can just read the dialogue. I guess I can add a couple little things. Um, so, this is what we talked about migratory connectivity being a valuable tool for understanding population declines. So this is my friend Julia letting a Nighthawk go. So this is what the data looks like from those tags. So you can see you know, these birds from all across the continent are kind of coming down. They're all crossing the Gulf together. And then they kind of pass through this pretty narrow channel in Colombia and the Andes and then they spill out 
into the Amazon and Cerrado uh, biomes of, of South America. So most of the birds that we tracked um, just spent their winter in Brazil. So, you know, we've got one bird way down at the bottom here uh, in northern Argentina, but the majority of these birds are in Brazil. Um, and then there's actually a little bit of movement during the wintering season. So we had a handful of birds actually relocate to second home ranges. Um, and then they start to move again. And there's some issue with the data there on the left hand side. Um, you can see, you know, birds are trying to head north again. Um, they, they, kind of, they, take, they do what's called a, a narrow loop migration. So they actually take a slightly shorter, more direct path So they actually, and they actually come back to, you know, within a kilometer of where we caught them. Um, the previous year. So the species has really high fidelity to their territories. You over the music. I, I, I can't, can't hear me. Over over the music. The music was louder than you were, so I missed oh, everything. Sorry. I wasn't really saying anything other than what was in the video. I was just describing it. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that wouldn't work. But you said the things that were in the video, but that's okay. Should we, can I move on? Is that okay? I'm sorry. I didn't realize that wouldn't work. Are we good? Move on. Okay. Um, so yeah, so essentially, um, their migratory connectivity is low. So during migration outside of North America, um, there's not a, there's a lot of mixing of the species. And, and the reason that they do that, it seems, so they essentially kind of all meet um, in one area along the Mississippi Flyway here, um, which, we th which was really interesting. So this is one of the things that I found really neat about the species is that um, they all went due east to what is probably some sort of ancestral migratory route before heading south. Um, so we actually had one individual, this bird right here, uh, was caught on Sydney Island. So this is a Sydney Island population of birds. And this bird flew, uh, what was it? I think it was like 3000 kilometers due east over the Rockies, like due east before turning south. Um, and so this is, you know, it's kind of an interesting, phenomenon, but it means that, you know, the populations are still kind of isolated when they're in North America, but then as soon as they hit that Mississippi flyway, they start to all mix together. And so we see, we see low connectivity um, outside of North America. And then the same thing is, is true in, on spring migration as well. Um, so they've got a slightly more direct route in spring. They've got what's called a narrow loop migration. Um, but again, you know, they're, they're all really mixed together. The only thing that we did find that we did notice was that there is this sort of peak in migratory connectivity right before uh, they cross the Gulf of Mexico during spring migration. And that, that Gulf crossing is pretty important. I mean, we have evidence from a couple of birds that they, they fly nonstop for five days. Um, they, they take off from Colombia and they keep going, some of them until, you know, they don't even stop when they hit the coast in Texas, they just keep going. Uh, and so you know, it's kind of, that's probably an area where maybe we want to, to spend some time thinking, you know, thinking about and looking at the, at the potential threats in that area because they're probably using that as a pretty important fueling region before undertaking this huge Gulf crossing. And then the wintering grounds, you know, we're, we're seeing pretty low migratory connectivity as well. And that's, to be honest, it's not a huge surprise. This kind of low migratory connectivity is common in long distance migrants. So here you can see, you know, we've got all our breeding populations here, and then they're all mixing together on the wintering grounds. And this is just an inset of those birds that moved around a little bit um, over the winter. So let's, let's bring our results back into this context of, of evaluating population declines. So based on this analysis that we've done and, and these GPS data, we can see that, um, you know, 
we're not really seeing strong evidence for uh, drivers of declines being during fall migration, except maybe in North America, probably not on the wintering grounds because of that, of that low migratory connectivity. And again, maybe on that one stopover in spring, that's certainly a region that we want to spend some more time researching. Um, but, you know, they could be occurring on the breeding grounds. Um, and so maybe that's where we kind of want to spend some more research focus. And of course, too, there could be interactions between some of these seasons, but those are pretty, that's a pretty complicated road to go down. So it, you know, we're, we want to look at some of these um, easier things to study first to see if red flags pop out there. And I think what's, what's neat about um, using migratory connectivity as a tool to kind of narrow down this huge list of potential declines is you can then sort of start to like think about, okay, well, what are these potential mechanisms? And, and we can kind of start to think, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe some of these might occur in the fall, but only in these particular areas. And, you know, probably not during spring or sorry, yes, maybe, but one in this one location during spring and then yes, on the breeding grounds. And so we can kind of start to narrow down this list. And so that's kind of the next piece of where this, this GPS um, tag research is going. But I think one of the big things that came out of that study was that, you know, I, I do think we need to look a little bit more carefully about on the, at the breeding grounds because of this low migratory connectivity. And so when we think about, we're gonna kind of switch over to breeding grounds now. And when we think about um, understanding drivers of population declines, um, you know, I think the first thing we need to think about is, well, what is, what, are, what does the data look like that's telling us what those population declines are? And I think, you know, the, the big question is, do Don point counts work for Nighthawks? So all of the, all of the evidence, well, a lot of the pieces of evidence that we talked about before, um, when we were talking about why, you know, why this species is of conservation concern, that information comes from the breeding bird survey, which as I, I suspect most of you know, is a dawn survey. So the breeding bird survey starts at a half hour before sunrise and continues for, you know, five and a half hours or six hours until, until all 50 stops are counted. But, you know, nighthawks are a crepuscular species. And so the question, I think for a long time, people have thought, well, these dawn point counts probably don't work, but no one had ever asked well, how much do they not work? Like how much, you know, how much faith can we have in these in this trend data? And so we started the, the Wild Research Nature Survey back in 2010 as a response to this sort of burning question. I mean, if we're gonna compare, if we if we wanna ask this question, then we, we need to have some information. Um, and so I, I suspect a fair few of you are familiar with this map, which is now uh, no longer used because the program has been transferred to Birds Canada. Um, but, you know, this is a handful of the routes that were available in Western Canada, um, sort of at an intermediate time. Um, and I, um, basically the, the program started in 2010, I think was three routes that focused on poor wills in the South Okanagan, and then we kind of built it up from there. And now it's a national monitoring program. And the reason it's a national monitoring program is because we, we did eventually ask that question. Um, do dawn point counts work for nighthawks? We took that Western Canada uh, Wild Research Nitro survey data and we compared it directly to the BBS. Um, they're very similar programs. Um, so the BBS is 50 stops, uh, each are three minutes long and each stop is 600 meters apart. The NHR survey is only 12 of those stops, but it actually uses the same stops and it uses every second stop. So they're 1.2 kilometers apart. And that's just to make sure that wing boom signal travels, travels very far. So that's just to make sure that, that we're getting independent um, observations at each point. And so we actually, we used a simulation approach um, to, to compare the two programs. But sort of right off the bat, we're kind of looking at, well, you know, what's the probability that you're gonna see a bird on either of these surveys? And so we can see, this is on the, on the left-hand side here, this is the breeding bird survey. And on our y-axis, we've got, you know, what's our probability of seeing a night hawk? And then on the x-axis, we've got time since sunrise. And you can see on the breeding bird survey, yeah, that probability essentially drops to zero right at sunrise. And this is not a surprise. This is a crepuscular species. They are a little bit active at sunrise, but it's usually before sunrise, it's usually before the breeding bird survey starts. And if you look at the data, you can see that, you know, nighthawks are really only ever detected on the first couple stops of the breeding bird survey. In contrast, the probability of detecting a nightjar on this Canadian nature survey or wild research nature survey 
it peaks, you know, 45 minutes after sunset. So these, this blue period here is the survey period for the community nitro survey and the red is for the breeding bird survey. And so the, the, that peak of probability of detection is, is actually sort of centered right around the survey period. So that's great. And then actually the, the day of year is not, um, of the breeding bird survey is often also not optimized for this species. So uh, the breeding bird survey runs from June 1st through till sort of just after July, but actually we don't really start to see nighthawks in sort of or in abundance, especially in Western Canada often until after June 15th. And so again, that survey period is not optimal for this species. The result of that is that the ability to detect a 30% decline um, with the breeding bird survey data is only 35%. Just means there's too much noise. There's, there's too many zeros in the data. Um, and so the, you know, there's a chance that the declines that we're seeing are actually much steeper than what's reported in the breeding bird survey. In contrast, when we when we add that um, wild research nitro survey data, that it almost doubles, and then we can actually put the two uh, the two data sources together, and then that that adds a, even a little bit better, uh, a little bit more information that allows us to detect declines. So, the, and this is this paper was actually the reason that that um, that the wild research nitro survey did become a formally supported program by, uh, by Environment and Climate Change Canada and, and why it moved to Birds Canada for sort of long-term management um, is because it was recognized that, that this is actually a really important um, program for long-term monitoring of the species, for building that baseline data set so that we can start to understand what the causes of the declines are. And like right now we know they're probably having a hard time. They're probably declining, but the, having a much higher precision uh, of, of uh, monitoring data uh, will really help us sort of start to understand those declines a lot better. And so we also looked at how well uh, the nature survey works for habitat modeling. And long story short, basically, you know, the breeding bird survey works okay um, if because there's so much data. The problem is that it doesn't work well in northern regions. And this is another reason why that why that wild research nitro survey or the community nitro survey is really important. So when we think about <clears throat> being a night hawk and being uh, sort of that dusk period being really important for defending your territory and for going out and getting your food, when we think about being a night hawk, then your behavior is going to change by latitude because that that civil twilight period or that sort of golden hour um, gets longer and longer the further north you go, and so the behavior of the species really changes depending on where you are. Um, you know, the, uh, the southern regions there is more night hawk activity at dawn because their not their sort of dusk twilight period is so constrained that they have to they have to do some of their night hawking at dawn. But the further north you go, you know, the, the, the more of that night hawking they're doing at dusk. And so it, it means that the breeding bird survey works more and more per, poorly um, for understanding night hawks the further north you go. And so we have this, we have this huge gap in, um, in the breeding bird survey trend map in the northern regions. And I know this is something that we see in a lot of species because we also just don't have the same survey coverage in those northern regions, um, but it's particularly problematic for night hawks. Um, and so again, the, you know, this, this um, alternative dusk survey is really valuable for filling some of those information gaps. The other thing that's really valuable for filling those information gaps are ARUs or autonomous recording units. And so what an ARU does is essentially like, it's an acoustic recorder so you can pre-program it to record along whatever schedule you want and you go out and you stick it on a tree and you leave it there for however long you want and then you come back and get it later and it's great uh, for remote locations it's great for nocturnal species because you can set it out during the day and come back later um and so you know <laughs> we've put out air use probably uh any, any way that you can imagine. I've put out ARUs by ATV, by helicopter, by snowshoe, uh, by snowshoe in a wetland, by canoe, canoe on ATV, snowshoe in kid sled. Um, we've used a lot of different ways to um, monitor nighthawks with ARUs. Um, it's been a lot of fun. And 
so long story short, and they also, yeah. And then the other advantage is because you set them up for a long time, they can collect a lot of information. So you get a much higher resolution um, picture of what's happening with the Nighthawks wherever you put your ARU. Long story short, they work really, really, really well for Nighthawks. It's partly because that vocalization is really simple. And so um, it's really easy to get a computer to, to process these acoustic recordings and pick out the detections of Nighthawks. Um, but also because Nighthawks are nocturnal. And so you know, we can put these out in Northern regions and much better understand um, the acoustic behavior and uh, the populations of these species in, in boreal regions. And I'm not gonna get into the details of why they work well, but if you're interested in this topic, this is actually a lot of what my PhD was about. And so there's a bunch of resources down here. Um, or you can also send me an email if you're, if you're excited about acoustic monitoring, because I'm excited about acoustic monitoring. Um, but I think a really fundamental question, regardless of how we count Nighthawks, whether it's by citizen scientists or community scientists, whether it's by acoustic recorder, I think a really fundamental question for the species is like, okay, but what do the detections mean? So it turns out Nighthawks are really, really mobile. I mean, I think we all knew that already. You see the see how mobile they are in, that, in those videos, they're so aerial. But when we put the GPS tags on them, we realized their home ranges on the breeding grounds are often bigger than 100 square kilometers. And so <laughs> trying to understand the relationship between a Nighthawk detection and the fact that it could be anywhere within a 100 square kilometer area, you know, it, it, the, the, the things that we're trying to learn about habitat relationships and, and populations, they get really fuzzy really quickly because they're just moving around so much. And so we kind of, we set out to try and provide a tool um, to, to understand what these detections mean. So we go back and then we think about, okay, so they've got those two different acoustic signals. They've got the call, the paint, and then they've got that wing boom signal. And so it is, you know, people have thought for a long time that that wing boom signal has been indicative of a territory or a nest location, but being able to actually substantiate that and quantify what, what size of an area that is would be a really valuable tool for interpreting monitoring data. So we did that. So we put VHF tags. So these aren't GPS tags. These are, um, these are tags that like provide a little, a little ping and it's uh, at a particular radio frequency. So you can uh, identify a bird um, using a handheld um, detector, but you have to be within a certain range of that bird. But it means, I mean, you can't, you can't read color bands on a Nighthawk because they have these tiny little legs. So it does allow you to at least identify individuals. And so we did that. We, um, we VHF tagged a bunch of birds up in Northeastern Alberta. So we're, we're north of Fort McMurray here. You can actually see a couple of the oil sands on this map here. Um, we put VHF tags on these birds and we went out and we tracked them. And we basically, we took a GPS point every time they made a wing boom. And so it turns out that wing boom signal is a territorial signal. So this is, this is a map basically of like the density of where each individual made his wing booms. Um, and so the different colors are different birds. And you can see, I think the important thing to take from this figure is that there's very little overlap between the colors. That means that like, Joe the Nighthawk here, he's wing booming in this area and his neighbor Bob is wing booming in this area and they don't overlap. And that makes it territorial because they're these exclusive areas. What we also learned that these territories are pretty small. So remember a home range can be a hundred square kilometers. A territory is about 10 hectares. And so that, that's a much more tractable unit of measurement when we start to think about counting birds per se, you know, thinking about population estimation. The other thing that's cool is that the wing boom signal is associated with the nest. So this is a map, sorry, this is a figure of probability of selection. So um, basically how likely is a nighthawk to perform that wing boom display relative to distance from the nest? And so we see that as you get further from the nest, the probability of them performing that display declines. Uh, and so that means that really, you know, what they're doing is, is they're wing booming over their nest. Um, and what's really cool is that, you know, their, their territorial fidelity. So this is 
Um, this is again, those same maps of density of where those wing booms are performed, uh, but these are two different years. So blue is 2016 and yellow is 2017. And you can see they're, they're essentially coming back to the same places every year, but these little shifts in where that territory is basically track the changes in their nest location from year to year. So kind of neat. So these wing booms are useful. First of all, they're super useful for finding nests and there's all sorts of uh, benefits to that for sort of an environmental impact assessment, for future research, lots of things. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is the next two things. So that we can use those wing booms to separate out different types of habitat use. And we can also use it um, to estimate populations. Boom. So when we build habitat models of the wing boom response, which is what we're gonna call territorial habitat use versus the call response, which is what we're gonna call home range habitat use. Those two signals essentially represent the territory and then that really huge home range. We do, we see big differences um, in, um, in, in the things that determine their habitat use. So we see, you know, we, we're still seeing, this is um, basically the, the thing that determines where where the nighthawks are or their habitat use. So pine is still really important for both types of habitat use, but it's way more important for that territorial habitat use. And then when we build predictive maps, and so this is Northeastern Alberta, um, again, you know, so this is that, this is approximately where we did the tracking study. Um, when we build um, maps of where we think nighthawks are going to be, where they're going to use their habitat use, we see these big differences between the two. So this is a really important tool because, you know, if I'm a species manager and I'm interested in protecting particular areas for nighthawks, you know, I, I'm, I'm maybe not going to be that interested in this, in this home range map. And that's, you know, there's a lot of areas in this map where there's sort of moderate probability of there being a nighthawk. And so it's like, well, you know, where are the important parts? But if we have this territorial map where we have these much more specific areas, you know, we've got this one up here that's really important, and then there's an area down here around Lac La Biche that's really important. It allows us to kind of pinpoint areas for potential protection with uh, a lot more precision. So we can also use that wing boom to separate out territorial habitat use and then extraterritorial habitat use. So basically like not territory. And, and the not territory is probably where they're doing a lot of their foraging. And so we used we used this differentiation to look at the to look at the importance of disturbance for this species in the boreal forest. And what we saw is that the, yeah there's really big differences um, in how these birds use the habitat in the boreal forest, depending on whether it's territorial or extraterritorial habitat. Um, and the take home here really is that they're, you know, we think that this species is a, dis is a disturbance specialist in the boreal forest, and, and that's true for nesting, but not for other habitat uses. So on the, on the y-axis here, we've got this probability of territorial habitat use, and then this is years since disturbance. We've got three disturbance types here. We've got fire, um, harvest, or, or forestry, and then we've got oil and gas well sites. And you can see that the, the probability of them using uh, the habitat declines with time since disturbance. So they like, they like open areas. Um, and the amount of pine um, in the area actually sort of mitigates that. Um, so the more pine there is, the better. Um, on the other hand, extraterritorial habitat, disturbance doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is wetland probability. So that means that they're probably nesting in disturbed areas or in areas with pine forest, and then they're foraging on the ends, on the edges of wetlands. And this is, you know, this is a really important finding because we've gone from thinking that Nighthawks need disturbed area in the boreal forest all the time, um, but we don't know why, you know, maybe it's for foraging, maybe it's for nesting. We've gone from that to knowing that if you see a wing blooming nighthawk, it means it's nesting. Disturbed areas are important for nesting, but we also need to protect wetland areas because they're important for foraging. So there's, there's this complement of habitats that, that's required for them to fulfill their life history needs. 
And so that last piece, um, we can also use that wing boom for population estimation. So again, thinking about that 100 square kilometer home range, which is that 10 hectare area, you know, that 10 hectare area is a much better unit to count nighthawks with. And so we've actually developed a new approach to population estimation that uses that, that small area and that actually satisfies some statistical assumptions of, of how we do population estimation. And we've applied this to a couple test areas in the boreal forest. Again, kind of thinking about and trying to demonstrate how important those disturbed areas are for nesting. So the current global estimate for this species is 23 million uh, pairs. I think it's pairs. Yeah, I think it's pairs. Um, but, you know, for all the reasons that we talked about before, this likely underestimates oral populations. And so we've used the wing boom to try and derive a couple population estimates for these relatively small areas in the boreal forest. And so what we, we found, yes, we did see them in much higher densities in close areas. I'm not going to get into the details of the model here. What was cool was that the, the mean territory size for our density estimates was 9.7 hectares. And remember, that we can compare that directly to the 10.2 hectares from the tracking data that we saw earlier. So we're, we're actually pretty confident in these population estimates. You know, we're getting a very, we're getting very similar numbers between these two methods. It means there's a lot of nighthawks out there. So I don't know if you can see this, but for this Northern wildfire area, so this is the, um, this is the big burn from, I think, I think it was 2014 that was up around Yellowknife. Um, you know, we're estimating 110, thousand males just in that burn alone. The South Wildfire area has 61,000 estimated um, breeding nighthawks. This is um, this is a, a portion of uh, a burn that occurred north of Fort McMurray. It wasn't the big Fort McMurray burn. It was actually a slightly larger one that was a few years earlier, but it never, it never made it down to the city. Um, but what's, what's interesting is that, you know, this, this population estimate of 61,000 males is just shy of the population, the current population estimate for the entire province of Alberta. So it means, it means there's a lot of nighthawks in the boreal forest. Boom, mind blown. I think it's pretty cool. There's a lot of nighthawks out there. Um, and so I think this leads us to sort of reevaluate the idea of conservation of this species in the boreal forest. Um, you know, it, it's given us a couple tools, um, certainly, you know, for there's a lot of resource extraction that occurs in the boreal forest. And so doing these, these surveys for wing blooms can allow us to protect um, nesting populations where they do exist. You know, I think we've learned that these wetland areas are also important in the boreal forest. You know, I, mean, I think we knew that they were important for the species and other aerial insectivores in more arid southern landscapes, but learning that they may also play a role in uh, providing foraging opportunities in the boreal is also really important context. It means that wetland conservation is important everywhere. But I think it does beg the question, you know, especially because the species uses disturbed areas for nesting, it begs the question, you know, how necessary is conservation per se in the boreal forest, especially given that we're expecting fire regimes, disturbance regimes to change and increase over the coming years. And so I think sort of the conclusion that I've come to, um, and then I, I'm like trying to convince other people to come to, is maybe we should be rethinking the idea that, this is, that the nighthawk should be managed as one species. Um, so when the when the common nighthawk was reassessed by Kosuik, this idea was floated um, and turned down because there was no evidence um, that, that the species should be split into to what are called designatable units. But if we look at sort of rough density estimation maps of this species, there's this huge gap in Western Canada and, you know, it kind of separates this big stripe of boreal populations from these big stripes of Southern populations. And I think there's a pretty good chance that there's some sort of genetic isolation on either side of that stripe. So in, in, this, in this map, the yellow is low density and the blue is high density. 
And we see that gap no matter no matter the modeling. So this is this is modeling that was done by the Boreal Levy Modeling Project. This is the modeling that I did for that uh, nightjar survey versus breeding bird survey comparison paper. And I haven't pulled it here, but you can see it in the eBird data too. So you can see it in the eBird models. There's this massive gap. And so I think, you know, I, I think maybe we should be thinking about um, doing some genetic work. The, there's an idea called a genoscape, which is essentially a map of gene flow across the range of a species. And this is an example here for a yellow warbler. And so this is something we're going to start working towards is, is collecting, um, collecting materials so that we can build a genoscape for the species and actually um, provide some evidence for the fact that, that perhaps we should be thinking about these two populations, two sort of super populations as separate management units. Um, you know, there's probably really diff really big differences in population trends between these two units. There's probably, I can tell you there are big differences in, in habitat associations I'm working on. Um, applying some of these methods to the, the Nighthawk population in Waterton Lakes National Park. And I can tell you they are not disturbance specialists in Waterton. They don't respond to fire the same way. And so there's these big differences. Um, and I think that that would probably allow us to um, focus our efforts on, on the southern population that probably is still declining as opposed to uh, sort of spreading it, spreading out our effort and muddying the waters by including that boreal population as well. Regardless, you know, we still are seeing these declines. And so then the next step is to use that GPS data, recognize this map is uh, a map of the locations where we deployed all those GPS tags. The next step is to take um, the information from where these birds are uh, spending their time across the annual cycle and start to actually correlate population trend across these different populations. Um, with the conditions that they're experiencing across their annual cycles. So with the conditions that they're experiencing in the breeding grounds, with um, the conditions that they're experiencing during fall migration in North America, and then also in Colombia during spring migration. Part of the reason we, we chose to deploy the GPS tags where we did um, was, was so that we span a gradient of those differential population trends. So we've got, you know, lots of populations that are declining. This one here in Arizona is really, really doing poorly. But then we've actually, you know, we've actually got one population here um, that we think might be increasing a little bit, the, uh, the Oregon population. And so understanding what's driving those differences in population trend will be a huge step towards helping to figure out what, what we can potentially do to, to halt and reverse declines. And the other thing we're doing is, is um, you know, just working on working together. So one of the nice things that's, one of the things that's nice about working on night is that it's, it's a really small community. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to work together. And so we work, we work really hard on standardizing and knowledge sharing. I mean, these are really, they're really neat birds, but they're really hard to study. Um, and they're pretty quirky in a lot of ways. And so sharing what we've learned with each other has been a really, really valuable. And it also means that we work together on some of these big projects. So, you know, we've, we're working on building a genoscape with a few collaborators. You know, there's a big, um, my colleague, Laura Graham at the University of Guelph is bringing together nest monitoring data to try and look at differences in nest success across the, across the range. Um, we're working on understanding diet across the range. We're working on toxicity um, and, and um, understanding using isotopes to understand uh, where birds are coming from as well. So there's lots of, I think we've come a long way in five or six years. Um, and I think we've filled, we're starting to fill some, some of the gaps that, that um, we need to understand to start to understand declines. But I think there's a, a still a road ahead and, um, I'm just really excited to share that road with, with a community that is really collaborative. Um, and so I think with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Oh, and if anyone's interested, so that Global Nature group that um, I mentioned at the beginning, it's essentially like an online community for anyone who is really excited about and wants to share knowledge about um, nature, so about the family as a whole. And so we do have a, um, a sort of group page, it's nightjars.groups.io if anyone is interested. And then with that, and just um, say thanks to all of the organizations that have provided salary funding, both for my PhD, but also for the research. 
to the community of people that have supported me. So especially, um, especially some of the GPS tracking work um, to, you know, takes 50 to, you know, there are 50 to 60 people involved in putting out those tags. It's not, it's not a small project. Um, and so I'm really, really grateful to the, the guidance from a lot of those folks and the, and the collaboration and the effort and the time. And then I just want to really give a special shout out to Wild Research. I know it was, um, the, the monitoring work is, is a small piece of what has become this big sort of Nighthawk research program, but but it really is at the core of where it all started. Um, and so I just want to give gratitude to, to Wild Research and, and that program that, that sort of brought me up and also to all the citizen and community scientists that that were sur out surveying for the species when the program was really new. Um, because I think those those contributions were really foundational. Um, and I'm I'm super grateful for people getting out there and surveying for the species when you know when I didn't really know what I was doing and, and I don't think any of us really know what we were doing but um, we knew that we were doing something good so thank you and so I think with that I will just leave you with this photo of a nesting nighthawk and see if you can find it um, this is, I think this is a great photo that sort of really um, sends home how how cryptic this species is and how hard they are to study And that's all I've got. Are you going to review the answer? <laughs> Can anyone find it? Is it in the bottom beside the little? Oh, there. Yeah. It's right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Quite amazing. Mm -hmm. So this is a female on a nest. And she didn't move until I basically got within a half foot of her. So they're, wow. they're not easy. They're not easy, but they're really neat. Well, thank you for that presentation and that and that test of the eye at the end. <laughs> Sorry for my, my technical flubs with the sound. I'm still um, never perfect. You actually have a few questions already coming in th through the chat. So okay. feel free to unmute and also put it in the chat. So maybe I'll, I'll read off the first question from Jennifer. She asks, okay. what is the purpose of the white bar markings? Yeah, so... <laughs> This is something that there's a, there's a couple different theories that they're for mate attraction. So the bigger your your white bars are, and the more white they are, the more handsome you are. The, you know, the better a chance you have at attracting a female. It it's thought to maybe be sort of an honest signal of male quality or, or how good of a father you're going to be because white feathers don't contain melanin and melanin adds physical structure to feathers. And so the idea is that if you can maintain really big white flashy white feathers, then you're a good bird because you can take good care of yourself. Um, I suspect there's, it's also just the fact that they're nocturnal and white reflects light better. So there a lot of species there, I think there are some mating displays in the common nighthawk that haven't been documented that involve um, the the white patches. I mean, outside of the wing boom, I've seen um, I've seen males do these really low, very shallow wing beats, and they circle around a female at dark in close proximity, and they're very clearly showing off their white patches. Um, but that that kind of display is seen a lot, and especially a lot of the eastern hemisphere birds. So there's these these really cool ones called the pennant wing night jars um, and standard wing night jars that have these very elaborate wing feathers and they do very similar um, displays. And so I, I think those white patches have, have a lot to do with just the fact that it's easier to see in the dark. Okay, thanks. Um, Teresa and uh, Dennis asked, 
Do you have an idea of what the current reading population in Greater Vancouver would be? There... <laughs> okay, so let's answer that one first, and then there's the second part. Okay, I suspect it's zero. Um, so there are very, very, very few detections, at least in the Wild Research uh, Nature Survey data set for the Greater Vancouver area. Um, I have a friend who found a nest in Burns Bog, so I take that back. Maybe not be zero, but I think I think it's it's very small. They, I think they've been essentially extirpated from the region, and this is this kind of gets into the, one of the potential mechanisms of decline that I didn't mention is that because this species is a ground nester, um, they actually used to nest a lot on gravel rooftops, um, and it's. And this gets kind of contentious, you know, it's thought that that's the reason why they were in a lot of um, urban areas is that they were nesting on these gravel rooftops. But no one builds gravel rooftops anymore, that roof, roofing technology has changed. And so that nesting habitat is now gone. And so, it, you know, it begs the question, well, you know, are, are we then trying, trying to conserve to a baseline that was perhaps inflated by these by this artificial nesting habitat or not. I mean, that's those are those sort of philosophical questions, um, but it, but that is the sort of predominant thinking behind why the species has disappeared um, from the sort of Metro Vancouver Greater Vancouver area. Um, what it was like pre colonization, I think, is a different question. Now. Hmm. So you kind of answered the second part. The it asks. Are there particular places you can go to see or hear them near Vancouver? So besides Burns Bog, would there be other locations that you could suggest? Yeah, so there, are actually Iona as well. There's always, I think they're probably in the dunes out at Iona. Angela's nodding. <laughs> yeah, so that's actually, we actually used to do orientations for the nature survey where we would take people to a place where you could probably see them and practice doing the survey. And so Iona was the spot that would reliably have them. Um, if you go over to the island though, they love, love, love the sort of like rocky areas in the Gary Oak Meadows in the Coastal Douglas for Biogeoclimatic Zone. Um, so yeah, like the areas around Saanich, a lot of the Gulf Islands, uh, up in the couch and valley, tons and tons of nighthawks. Okay, thanks. You can also, the, all the nature survey data is freely available on nature accounts and you can go download it and check it out yourself too. <laughs> Very helpful, thank you. Here's another question about connectivity. Mm -hmm. Do nighthawks stick with their neighbors when they go to South America or do they mix it up? Do they always return to the same North America area? Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of the take home. They they don't stick together. They, I mean, whether whether individual like neighboring birds stick together, we don't know. But sort of at a slightly larger scale, like whether this bird and this bird from this same population stick together, they don't. They, you know, like one is in Brazil and one's in Argentina, but they do. They come back to exactly the same spot. I mean, we didn't do a lot of monitoring of female returns just because they're a lot harder to catch and a lot harder to track but the the couple females that I did have banded and now like they're coming back to nests within 20 meters of the previous year like the fidelity is really 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 high I don't know what's so special about that particular patch of sand but apparently they think it is maybe a related question to that do they mate for life then that one we don't know. We don't know how. We don't know what the longevity is. I suspect so, because it's you know they're probably coming back. I think. I mean, if we think about sort of like life history theory and the fact that they're only laying two eggs a year, as opposed to something like a sparrow, which is laying five or six, and so having you know, and sometimes having more than one nest, so having a lot more offspring, they have a much faster. Um, Sort of lifestyle. They, they probably don't live as long, whereas the nighthawks, because they're only laying a couple of eggs a year, they probably have a slightly lower um, or slightly slower life history strategy, and they probably live a little longer. But again, we just don't have data on that right now. Okay. All right. Here's a different question. What do the raptor population have to do with this issue? 
don't know. Honestly, if I had to guess, I'd say very little. Um, I don't think that, and maybe someone else knows more than me on this one. I don't, I don't think raptors are huge predators of ground nesting birds. Um, the, so that Alora Graham, who is at the University of Guelph is studying a population that has a much lower nest success rate than the one that I studied. So up where I studied these birds, you know, they're doing really well. Like, 70% of nests are probably surviving. The nest predation is really low. They're in a post-fire area. There's just not a lot of things out there that are eating them. But Alora studies them in a much more, she's sort of in Southern Ontario on these rocky barrens. And she studies them in an area where there's higher primary productivity. It's sort of this urban rural matrix. And so she sees a lot more of uh, predation and, and she's actually identifying some of the predators and she's seeing things like raccoons, cats, those are the kind of things that that go for ground nests. So, I yeah, I, my guess is that probably not a lot. And I, I think catching a, an adult nighthawk, like the predation rate on adult nighthawks, is probably pretty low. I, they're so incredibly aerial. You'd be you'd be hard pressed if you were a hawk. Okay. Um, this is back to the, the, the migration pattern. Are mm -hmm. there other night jars which nest in South America and migrate to North America? Opposite pattern. Mm, I'm going to say no. So again, we don't know a lot about the migratory status of other night jars. Um, but the sort of typical pattern with migration is that um, birds radiate from the tropics to breed, whether that's because there's too much competition where they are, or because there's better resources sort of during the breeding season at, at the poles. Um, hard to say, but, but migration doesn't typically work the opposite direction where you breed here and, and go up here. Birds, there may be nitro species, that being said, that winter in the tropics and migrate south to breed. Um, but I, I don't know that much about them. And again, this is, I mean, this is sort of uncharted territory. Yeah. Um, this one, I'm not sure if there's a typo or just my poor geography. Do you think that they migrated cross ice to Bering Sea or Bering? Bering the Bering Sea? Yeah, I think Bering Sea. I'm gonna have to look up a map, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know that they go that far. Yeah, I don't think they're breeding up that far. Um, Can I clarify that? Yeah, uh, go for it. I get Beringia. The oh, icy have... area uh, that some of the birds are going to in uh, Yukon Northwest Territories, and I wonder if they may have an ancestral pathway across ice, that might help explain that uh, migration. It's just conjecture, of course, you won't know the answer. Yeah, to that. I'm just, sorry, I'm just trying to catch up here. Beringia, oh, I see, okay. I mean, maybe I do, I do think glaciation is probably responsible for the current pathway though like the fact that it does sort of seem that radiation that they do just sort of seem to follow what would have been the glacial recession so I, I the specifics of your question like the geographic specifics of your question I'm not sure but I do think you're on the right track there um, and it, I think that's a, would be another cool thing to look at with the genoscape is to be able to 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 compare that migratory pathway with a map of gene flow would be, I just think that would be super cool. Okay, um, here's the question about the eggs. Then mm -hmm. what birds lay eggs on the ground in February and March in the Andes? I cannot answer that question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is this a pop quiz? <laughs> 
<laughs> and feel free to unmute. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'll just keep reading the questions out here. Oh, okay, um, I, I, I just observed uh, eggs on the ground when we were on a geology field trip mm -hmm. uh, near the border of Argentina and Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And, and they were just lying in the ground like that. Yeah. And I had no idea what kind of birds they were. And the people yeah. I was were looking at rocks. But um, as it turned out, the guys who were driving our trucks uh, went and got the eggs and ate them for lunch. Oh. And uh, I, I just really didn't know what they were. The other mm. thing we saw at the same location was a condor. You know, it was a really mm. hot. Yeah. Were know. they big? Were they big eggs? How big were they? The eggs? Yeah. No, just you know. Just little, yeah. I, I, th I, there's lots of species that ground nest. Um, okay, thanks. I just, yeah, the shorebirds, like all the shorebirds, ground nest as well. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of sort of Andean shorebirds. Up, so, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not a South American bird expert. I've been once. That's we didn't have any birders on the trip. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I can't help. Um, okay, here's a question. Oh, actually, a compliment first. Thanks for your fascinating presentation. Um, I live on the Sunshine Coast in an area where night hawks are frequent in the summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions for how I could get involved in citizen science monitoring and reporting? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so if you go to the Birds Canada website, you can just look up the Canadian Night Dirt Survey and they have a portal um, where you can sign up and they have a map that's almost identical to what we used to have where it basically shows all of the survey routes that are available um, or all the survey routes that exist, which ones are available for adoption, which ones are reserved, and you can just click on a route and sign up and then their coordinator, Andrew, will be in touch. Um, doing a survey is really low commitment. So it, the survey itself takes about two hours um, and then there's probably another like hour of getting yourself acquainted and an hour of data entry and you only have to survey once a year. Um, so Angela can probably, <laughs> she's probably done more surveys recently than I have. <laughs> but it's, it's a really, I think it's a really fun way to get outside and it's kind of neat to be out at dusk. Um, and just experience things at a different time of day. Um, so yeah, I would really encourage folks to get involved. The Sunshine Coast is a great place to look for Nighthawks. Again, it's that like sort of arid coastal Douglas fir thing going on. Um, yeah, and if anyone has questions or like wants more guidance on how to how to access those programs, just give me, send me an email. I think if you're still, if you can still see my screen, my email is just up here. Well, no. There we go. Um, so it's just alienate at gmail.com. Um, give me a shout and I can sort of facilitate uh, connecting you with those programs. Okay, perfect. The same person said that they will be in touch with you. Cool. Um, here's a, a question. What type of areas do they frequent in South America? I'm actually just working on this right now. Um, they, it's so it seems like it, their habitat use is really different on the wintering grounds. So they're kind of split between the Amazon, basically the, the Amazon forest, and then this Cerrado biome, which is more sort of like open grassland. Um, but they kind of just they kind of just hang out on the wintering grounds. So remember I said that the the home ranges on the breeding grounds are 100 square kilometers. On the wintering grounds, they're like yeah, maybe two or three square kilometers. Um, so it seems like they're kind of going down there and just like chilling and eating bugs, sitting in a tree. Um, a lot of them are in really, really dense Amazonian forests. So really different from what they're doing on the breeding grounds, which are these open habitats. Again, they need that bare ground for nesting. So we see them, you know, we see them in open pine forests. We see them on sandbars. We see them... Um, you know, in disturbed areas in the lower forest and grasslands. Um, we don't see them in contiguous forest and on the breeding grounds, but we do on the wintering grounds. So it, yeah, it seems like they're just doing something different down there. Okay, great. That's so far the questions on the chat, but 
feel free to unmute yourself and, and just jump in. I have to say that I learned a new word today, crepuscular. I think that's such a cool word. That's a good one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for photography, that is the golden hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a lovely time of day too. I can, I can really identify with the Nighthawks. <laughs> Looks like we might have um, exhausted the questions. There were quite a few questions there. Those were good questions. I enjoyed them. If anyone has other questions, again, feel free to get in touch. It's talking about Nighthawks is like my favorite thing to do, so. All right, well, um, Angela, would you like to do the closing? Sure. Can you hear me this time? Isn't Zoom great? Well, thank you very much, Ellie. That was definitely a fascinating talk. You can tell by um, how many questions we had that everyone definitely enjoyed it. So thank you very much for that. And thank you everyone for joining us. And hopefully we see you all next week. And take Thanks care. For hosting me. Night. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. You know what? There's a, a last question here from Dr. Hickman. Do makes show any particular preference from female markings? Not really sure what that means. Do males. Oh, males. <laughs> I don't know that anyone has studied that. Trying to think of parallels in non night jar literature. I'm sure. I, I do like as as females get older, they do start to develop more male plumage characteristics, and that's certainly true in the night jar. It's true, like the the buffy throat becomes more <laughs> white as the females get older. So there might be some signaling there, but I'm I'm not sure. I, I do know. One of the things that's really neat about female night jar plumage, and this is some research out of um, somewhere in the UK, I think, um, female night jars actually match their plumage with their nesting substrate. So not just by species, but by individual. So like, if you're a particularly gray night jar, then you're going to pick a nesting substrate that is particularly gray. So they're like actively maximizing their camouflage when they nest, which is just so cool. All right. Well, thank you. This is very informative and I, I learned a lot. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it.